Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Terrace Talk. Norwich City head to the capital tomorrow to play QPR, hoping to finally secure the championship title after two defeats, although one because largely of a red card and the second one largely because of celebrations and a lack of preparation. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what the response is this weekend. I'm delighted to be joined by Norwich City fan and host of the Allergy and Free From show, Ben Corbett, who's joined us outside. Ben, just um, just tell us where you are first and foremost. Not not exact location, but, you know, a rough idea. Oh, no, we haven't lost Ben early on, have we? We might. <laughs> well, I, well, that's all right. Do you know what? I'm, I've, I'm back in the office now, and it seemed like a strange thing when you're based... When you're based in Buckingham, to sort of uh, force everyone to listen to me talk about Norwich for 30 minutes while they're trying to get on with their work. And it's a lovely day. There's a guy over there painting some some lines for the cricket pitch. So summer's clearly on the way. There's a red kite in the air. As long as you guys can hear me, I thought it'd be a nice day to be out in the park. <laughs> You know what? I love it. And I was a little bit concerned right at the start there with Lost You, but it seems like we've got you back. So that's that's good. Um, I'm also joined by uh, QPR fan and um, uh, and sort of fan site runner Clive Whittingham. Clive, how are you? I, QPR's form at the moment, it, does it seem a little bit strange? I've seen some of your tweets recently um, and, and I get the sense that it does seem a little bit strange to see QPR in the top half of the table for a change. Yes, enjoying watching QPR is uh, is unfamiliar and alien to all of us. Really, it's normally a, a, a very stressful and uh, an unenjoyable thing. So yeah, we've had a great time since uh, since New Year, and uh, don't want the season to end. Really, absolutely. And 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 before we get going, I thought we'd um, we'd talk a little bit about the reports from QPR's perspective about Mark Warburton this week, which were a little bit strange in terms of how they cropped up. It was a a job in the FA, wasn't it, that he was linked to, I I think, by a national outlet. Um, QPR then released a statement to say that wasn't the case and that he wasn't on the cusp of leaving to to join the FA as an assistant technical director, I think was the the official term. But did that kind of strike fear in in, in QPR fans, the the link of of, of him away? Because it seems like he's done a fairly solid job so far this season. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, um, when you look back to Christmas, when we chatted last and when we played Norwich last at that stage, it sort of felt like Warburton might be on his last legs at QPR. We're obviously not uh, shy of sacking a manager and the spectre of Tim Sherwood was looming large over the club again. Um, And, you know, at that point, if although we did a vote on our website and 60% of the people, even then, after 10 games without a win, still wanted him to stay, there was still a good uh, portion of QPR fans probably wouldn't have been that sorry if he had gone. And It's the complete reversal now. He's done such a good job when you look at the players that have gone out of the team um, and that we've actually improved on everything from last year. You know, one more games, higher up the league, better defence. Considering the players we lost, that's a hell of an achievement. Seems to be really good at developing the young players, which I think is where this link as a technical director at the FA has come from. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was in the sun, um, quite apart from you know, the harm that that newspaper does to our society and our politics, just anybody, you know, and the Hillsborough stuff, quite apart from that, anybody that still reads it just needs their head examining because they publish so much stuff that just isn't true. And they've gone again with a story this week saying that Mark Warburton's definitely going to the FA. They've then taken that story down later that night and then the following day published another exclusive saying um, he's going to extend his contract at QPR. So, you know, just usual stuff from that comic. We're still waiting for our 15-point deduction they promised as we were getting in 2010-11, um, the year that we won the title. So um, on anyone that still reads that rag needs a head examining. It's just the latest in a long line of uh, untruths that they've published. In terms of this week, Ben, uh, a lot of the conversation has been around this European Super League and, of course, the uh, the top six clubs, big six clubs, sort of self-proclaimed big six, signing a, a deal to go off and, and join all the European elites in, in a league with no relegation, no real competition. Um, I think widely considered all about money. But whilst I've got you guys here, I was interested from both perspectives to hear your thoughts on, on these proposals, which now seem... Um, to well, all, all of those clubs have backed down, haven't they? After significant fan pressure and and pressure from the media. Firstly, Ben, from your perspective as a Norwich fan, does it make you appreciate the way the club is run a lot more? That seems to be sort of the general consensus that I've seen on on social media so far this week. 
I mean, yeah, obviously, you wouldn't you wouldn't catch Delia doing something like that, would you? But equally, I think that um, I think at the basis of everything and all conversation around this is that the football pyramid has al- always been based on earning what you get. And if uh, there's going to be a competition that you can be in without earning the right to be there, that's just absolute utter madness. It doesn't make sense. It's not football. It's the end of football. And if you've got six teams that are going to have access to uh, a huge pot of money that other people don't, who are already uh, richer than everybody else, then that's going to drive up wages. It's going to drive up transfer fees. And for teams like Norwich, the chances of competing would, would have become even less. And you get fairy tales every year. You Even the idea that West Ham could qualify for the Champions League is a fairy tale. It's it's brilliant. And the fact that an Orange fan could look at that and think, do you know what, with a good wind in a few years' time, we we could if West Ham could do it, we could sneak into fourth place. To have that taken away, no longer have that aspirational uh like goal ahead of you that with a good wind, with a bit of luck, when most of the other teams have a bad season, that you could possibly do that. To have that taken away would be insane. Insane. And the fact that it seems to have um it's, it's a can that you feel like you're kicking down the road every few years that these six clubs are trying to gain more money and more uh, power. And the worry is that eventually they'll come up with something that's going to stick. But it seems for the time being that this one at least hasn't. And I think we can all be pleased about that. Yeah, I've seen the various club apologies, which are along the lines of um, the, the train was leaving the station. We had to decide to, whether or not to jump on, which for me just doesn't wash really in terms of maybe them thinking about their pockets before supporters and, and, and all of that. Um, Clive, what, what are your views on, on the ESL? The ESL? And, and also, um, uh, as a second part to that question, what do you feel needs to happen now? Not just in terms of punishments, but in terms of the, the changes to the game as a whole. What needs to happen to ensure that supporters get a bit more of a voice? I'm quite cynical about the the whole thing, just, just for a change. I think given the amount of money that was apparently involved in this and the the multi-billionaires that were backing it, and JP Morgan and all of this, to stick a, a fairly amateur-looking press release out at 9.30 on a Sunday night and then within 48 hours the whole thing's fallen apart and they're apologising for being so stupid, I just I don't buy that, to be honest. There's some There's something missing here and I think, what you'll probably see is other stuff will now come through, like the um, the reforms to the Champions League that have already been proposed, which involves greater share of payment and some placements in there based on your historic performance rather than how you've done now. Like we said, it's all designed to keep the same clubs involved and you know avoid this potential of West Ham or Wolves or Leicester Gate crashing the party if you happen to do something stupid like replace Mauricio Pochettino with Jose Mourinho so I think you'll see a lot of things like that coming through now and maybe possibly be waved through because they're not as bad as the ESL it's like they've moved expectations up to here and now they're going to move a load of stuff which still isn't very good in underneath that like there's talk about Rangers and Celtic coming down into this league again now They've obviously they want more voting rights in the Premier League, which got kicked out, you know, earlier in the season. I just wonder what they're actually going to try and sneak in now and maybe be able to get away with because it's not as bad as um, as the ESL. The the immediate reaction, you know, is good riddance. You know, if they want to go, let them go. And, you know, will be it'll be more competitive and, and clubs like ours will have more chance of competing for leagues and cups and European places. But I think you've got to remember that. We're still the whole championship business plan, in so much as it is a business plan, is reliant on uh, television money. Um, and Sky BT, they're not going to be paying whatever they're paying now. I think it's more than five billion every three years for a Premier League that doesn't have those six teams in it. Um, they're not going to pay that money for Newcastle versus Crystal Palace. So that television market would collapse, and with it, ours would collapse. And over time, there would be a huge reset, which you perhaps think would be a good thing um, that we're not paying footballers so much money that the championship teams aren't losing so much money. You've seen Reading's accounts last week were a train wreck and Bournemouth before that. You know, there is this idea that football does need a reset, but getting from where we are now to there, you know, that wouldn't be like turning the TV off and on again. It wouldn't be like resetting the Super Nintendo. It would. That would be many, many years of, of pain and, and reset. You would probably get to a better place further down the line. Um, 
but it would take a long time to get there and, and clubs like ours would, would suffer horrendously in the meantime. Like I say, I'm not sure I ever really believed it was a thing and I think it's more a Trojan horse to try and smuggle some other stuff in under the guise of, well, at least it's not as bad as that. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, ben, as, as a Norwich fan, as, as a club that are now entering and becoming one of those other 14, just as a final point on this, what would you like to see happen to, to those big six clubs in terms of, of punishments? I guess that's kind of where this conversation has shifted to now. It's happened, it's fallen apart. Now it's about what needs to happen. I, there was obviously a report in, in the Times last night about uh, the Premier League um, writing in a new rule that if a club signs up to a breakaway league, it's immediate expulsion from here. What needs to happen now to these top six clubs? Fines, point deductions, what, what do you think? Well, I guess I think like uh, what you're saying there is the Premier League bringing in a rule for the future. If that's the case, then I guess that suggests there's a possibility that punishing them this year for essentially signing a document that they don't follow through on could end up uh, becoming a bit sticky in terms of appeals and stuff like that. Um, essentially, they did sign up to something. I think there's a chance they might get a punishment financially from the contract that they now have to get themselves out of that they've signed up for uh, with the the ESL. So uh, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't think point deductions and stuff for something that didn't happen. But I think uh, it's more about safeguarding the future and making sure that uh, like you say, bringing in rules now that mean that this doesn't take place in the future. Because like Clive's saying, you know, essentially this could be a PR and a, a negotiating stunt, which would, would, you know, that's not a good thing. But at the end of the day, uh, they've pulled out of it within a couple of days. So I think it would, it would ruin next season if you have those six teams like on minus 12. It's not going to be... The, whoever won the league, there would be an asterisk next to their name oh, that's the season where all the big clubs had a points deduction. So that's why they won the league. And no one wants that. No one wants that from the start. And I get that there should be repercussions, but there's no point in writing off next season a competitive uh, competition between 20 teams straight away, I don't think. So, you know, how would financial, uh, um, you know, they've got a lot of money, but are you really going to find them an amount that's going to make a real difference to the day-to-day -day running of any of those clubs? I think... This has been a learning experience for everyone. And the important thing is not a reaction in the moment, but uh, a safeguarding of the future, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and of course the government have announced a, uh, a fan-led review, haven't they, into into football, and we'll see what changes um, comes of that. I think that's due to to be released later in the summer. So, yeah, hopefully this is a, a time for football, a watershed moment, if you like, and it can maybe give a bit more of a say to the fans. And of course we've heard the the ideas about the German model being floated, the fifty plus one one. So, um, we'll we'll see how we we get on with that. But that's enough of the ESL. Let's let's focus on the championship and the game tomorrow, Clive. Just to start with you. Daniel Farker today in his press conference made a, a good point about QPR and said since the reverse fixture, if you look at the form table, it's Norwich, Watford and then QPR. So you referenced maybe about feeling that Mark Warburton's time was up prior to, to maybe that Norwich game or around then. What has what has changed for, for QPR and for Mark Warburton that has, has led to this uplifting form? Uh, we made some decent. We did some decent recruitment in January. Um, with hindsight, it looked a bit mad at the time. Um, but obviously, Charlie Austin came in up front. It's made a big difference to a strike force that wasn't really scoring. Um, he's he's scored a lot of goals himself, but also seems to have really given the others, given the rest of the team, confidence that we're not going to keep dominating games and creating chances and not getting the result because you know Charlie's here now and. That seems to have rubbed off on Lyndon Dykes, who'd obviously gone 22 games without a goal, but now has six goals in seven games. Um, so Charlie made a big difference. Sam Field's been great from from uh, West Brom. Jordi Device from Hull um, is unbeaten in the games he has played. He's struggled with injury, but, but he's um, been a good signing. And Stefan Johansson from Fulham. I mean, I watch a lot of championship football and had watched a lot of Fulham at this level. And I can't ever say I really noticed Stefan Johansson as anything out of the ordinary, but he has been absolutely unbelievable for us. Um, such a good player, made a huge difference in midfield. Um, and if we'd had this team together, you know, from the start, you know, we'd be right in there, I think. Um, like you say, third in the third in the form table. We changed formation as well, went to a back three and wing backs, which has suited us a lot more than what we were playing previously. Our fullbacks are, are not particularly good, so 
moving them further up the field and adding a third centre back has kind of moved them out of an area they were getting exposed and and uh, and improved that. Um, and playing really nice football. We also, you know, we we do kind of rely on projects and young players now. We, you know, one of the bottom five budgets in the league. And having lost the players, we lost, you know, Wells, Hugill, Eze. Right, I say Samuel went in January. Ryan Manning's good player lost him. Grant Hall went to Middlesbrough. It's quite a lot of talent going out the team. Freeman Luongo had gone the year before. Smithies, Anua, Jack Robinson. You know, all these players have left QPR in the last couple of years. And the players that have been brought in have often been young players or sort of punts and projects. And it takes some time to settle. You, you know, you can't... I know we expect immediate gratification and results and whatever, but it's going to take take them time to, to find their feet at this level. Um, and you've seen players like Chris Willock this year who wasn't really in the team at the start of the year and looked a bit lightweight when he was, just absolutely took Swansea apart on, on Tuesday night. He's really come on strong. Um, so, yeah, it's a mixture of things. We made some good signings. We changed the formation. We got on a bit of a roll and got some confidence and, and players have found their feet. Um, and we're actually good to watch at the moment. We've fallen in a hole a couple of times, Birmingham away and Huddersfield at home, not so good. Um, so we are still capable of that. But, you know, overall, good team to watch, uh, playing well, quite quite dangerous a minute, at the minute, I think. Two two wins against Middlesbrough and, and Swansea. Does, does that kind of show where QPR are? Mathematically now can't get into the playoffs, but it, it, does this feel like if this run maybe kick-started a little bit earlier, then there could have been a genuine late push to maybe state your claim for the, for the top six? Yeah, I mean, we're just hamstrung by the start of the season. We won four of our first 24 matches. Um, so even if we just won a couple more... Um, We'd be right in there, but you, you don't make you don't make the playoffs after after winning four of your first twenty four games. Um, I think the last two games show that there's there's not going to be any um, end of season, you know, on the beach kind of attitude at QPR. Warburton's very very particular about that. Last the end of last season didn't go well, but even on the final day of the season when we were away at West Brom. Most of the QPR fans didn't even want us to win that game because we thought it'd be funny if Brentford messed up on the last day, and they did, and it was. Um, but we picked our strongest team at Middlesbrough, in Cl- at uh, West Brom, sorry, including Eze, who we were about to sell for 20 million quid. I bet our chief executive was watching that game like that. Just don't, you know, <laughs> nobody touched him, nobody touched him. But Warburton's not one for slinging a load of kids in and, and sacking games off and talking about next season. He wants to finish. He wants to better our points total and finish from last year so that he can show that we're, we're progressing year on year, which it feels like we are. Um, yeah, if it had started a little bit earlier or we hadn't been quite as bad as we were in the first half of the season, we'd be probably where Barnsley are. Um, they had a slightly better first half of the season, started slightly earlier than us. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to complain. If you'd given me this, um, if you'd given me this at the start of the season, I definitely would have taken it. If you'd given me this at Christmas, I would have just said you were mad. Like it just wouldn't be possible. So very happy. Yeah, and hopefully that can that can be taken into next season and, and a little bit more optimism around around QPR. That that will certainly be good to see. Ben, I think this is the first time we've ever had um, some bird song in in the background of Terrace Talk. But I'm all <laughs> for it, mate. I love it. Um, in terms of Norwich City's last two defeats. Do they do they concern you at all? Do you accept kind of the the reasons that Daniel Farker has has maybe offered and, and the mitigation that is there for for Norwich? Did you hear that question, Ben? I feel we may have lost Ben here. Clive, we'll come back to you. Come back it's to you strange because anyway. I can hear birds. <laughs> I can hear birds, but I can't hear Ben. Yeah, hopefully we'll get Ben back in, in just a second or two. Um, oh, well, there we go. Have we got you back, Ben? Maybe not. Clive, we'll come to you Maybe then. Um, <laughs> I can talk about Norwich if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, I'll, I'll throw it over to you then in terms of, of Norwich. Um how do you feel playing them at the minute? Because it feels maybe they're a slightly different proposition after two defeats and, and, and promotions secured than maybe they were beforehand. Yeah, I'm hoping it might be a good time to play you guys, obviously partying. And uh, I mean, it's all, I know that you you were saying, um, as I'm sure we would have been doing, oh, it's not done until it's done and will we win the title and whatever. I've just thought that Norwich I, mean, would... I don't know, man. To be honest, we we do <laughs> things a little bit different at Norwich. We all know that. We've, oh, we've been praised for it. Well, hello. 
We got you back, Ben. I think we lost you for a minute there. Hello, you got me back. I've got you back. Okay, yes, cool. continue what I'm you're saying. Somewhere Sorry. I might have a bit more a bit better signal, but if if I'm gone, on then and chat chat amongst yourselves for a second. I've got a lot to say on the subject. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to you, Ben, when we get a bit of a better connection. Clive, sorry, continue what you were saying. Um, yeah, um, I'm enjoying this. Um, it's slightly chaotic, yeah, isn't it? Like I say, I know, I know you guys will have, will have played it cool and, and been worried all the way through, but I've thought that Norwich would, would win the league by some distance from the start, and, and you have. It just struck me as being part of the plan that you would... Um, you would go up and if you stayed up, then good. But if not, let's not blow the whole budget and do what QPR did and come back in a right state. You know, let's come back and, and go again in a, in a stronger position. Um, and, and that's exactly what you've done. I mean, I think the Premier League teams coming down were at an advantage this year because um, I think a lot of the championship teams have not spent money that they usually would have done because they didn't know what the situation was going to be with crowds and COVID. Um, so the parachute payments have been an even bigger advantage than normal. I also think the three Premier League teams have inevitably come down with bigger squads, uh, which helps a lot when the championship is uh, even more mental than normal, trying to cram it into seven and a half months instead of nine. So you, you had those advantages, but I just felt like Norwich planned for this all the way through. We're obviously going to win the league and, and have done. Um, it makes me laugh when Thomas Frank says that there's no outstanding team in the championship. I mean, you know, just beating someone seven, you're just beating Huddersfield seven nil. You lots get that's not bad if, for for not being the outstanding team in the league. Um, so yeah, it's, it's no real surprise, and I'm just hoping, like I say, that you know it's kind of job done from you guys now, and uh, the queue goes on the rack, and we can uh, we can turn you over uh, tomorrow. I think guys, if QPR players they have been playing recently, it'll be and and Norwich are. are at, sort of their level rather than on the beach level. It could be a really good game. Yeah, two two really good football insides as well. I know Daniel Farker said that um, he felt QPR maybe didn't mention his own team, but he, he certainly felt QPR up there were the best in terms of how they play in this division. So it's um, it's going to be interesting to watch. Ben, I think we've got you back. So I can uh, I can throw the question over to you and hopefully... Yeah. Well, there we go. We can hear you now. So that's good. That's good. Um, my question was, in terms of the two defeats... Was there any level of, yeah. of concern for you as a, a Norwich fan or do you accept kind of the, I don't want to say excuses, maybe reasons is better, the reasons that Daniel Farker was given for those two results? I mean, I, as I said earlier, I think, well, I'll try to say, but I'm sorry about the connection. Um, <laughs> I think that we do things differently at Norwich and uh, we often get praised for it. But I have to say, I've, I've never seen a team say job done before it was mathematically done <laughs> and it was a bit weird it was a bit weird to hear oh it's just done we're definitely up uh you, you don't have to worry about it anymore we're, we're gonna win the league all, all that sort of stuff and then after that hearing uh i was probably still gonna win the, the, the league all this sort of stuff i don't love it if i'm honest about it and i know we had this target of, of points but when you watched the Watford game the other day, it looked like a team that had something to play for against a team that didn't have something to play for. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, you know, you hear Clive talking about uh, QPR going right to the end, no matter what. I want to see a bit more of that from us, if I'm honest. Um, and I think I don't want to... S- there's been a little bit of, oh, we've lost to Watford twice, we've lost to Bournemouth twice, what does that say about next season? I don't completely buy into that because there are, there are mitigating circumstances, certainly to the Bournemouth game, to the Watford game that we can look into. But there's still it still has created a narrative around that that's brought a little bit of doubt into some supporters' minds. And you want to go into next season on a high, you want to go into next season uh, winning games, and it would be a real shame if we got pipped at the post by, by Watford. I don't think that's what we deserve. And uh, I would have preferred a bit less of the job done and a bit more of the we'll celebrate when we've got the title. I, I just That's what my preference would have been. And um, I, it's not often I say anything negative about, about old oh, Mr. Fucker. I'm a big fan. But I don't know whether they played that right, <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah. No, I think I think it's I think I think the points you make are completely valid. And and with that in mind, does it make you 
more nervous? The fact that, of course, there are only five points between Norwich and Watford now heading into tomorrow, or are you still relatively comfortable with the position Norwich are in? Three games left, five points clear of Watford. Clive's already handed them the title. Is is that kind of a, a view you share, or, or, or for you now, is it just about getting it done as soon as possible? So it's just uh, it's it's just over and done. I would like to win the league. There's no doubt about it. And I would be frustrated if we didn't. Uh, having said that, it's not the most important thing. It's more important that we get promoted, for one. There's other things that I see as more important. In fact, if you told me that someone like Pookie or Hanley uh, was carrying a bit of an injury, for example, and to win the league, we played them when they were sort of 70% fit and it meant that they missed out on going to the European Championships, I would rather not win the league and see those guys have a brilliant tournament and be able to watch Norwich players represented on the international stage in the summer and come second because we're going up, we're going up. So, that, you know, it's not winning the title is I'm not going to lose sleep in it in, in three months time. But uh, to feel like we didn't win the title because we took our eye off the ball and there was too much celebrations and stuff like that, that doesn't that doesn't sit particularly well with me I think we'll probably still get the job done I know Watford have still got a couple of hard games coming up or what you would perceive to be hard games uh, six months ago I don't know whether a game against Swans in Brentford is considered hard anymore but uh, yeah I, I think we'll get the job done but it's um, it's not the end of the world if we don't <laughs> I'd like to see the lads of the Euros I'd like to see uh, Norwich in the Premier League they're probably both uh, both more important things to me certainly Mm. Interest, interesting um, viewpoint that interesting it'd be interesting to see whether whether uh, many Norwich fans uh, uh, agree with you and I'm sure they'll let us know down in the comments when this video goes up <laughs> um, Clive there is a situation tomorrow where Norwich can win the title if if Watford drop points to Millwall which is perfectly feasible given um, the fine margins usually that Millwall play it and sort of in very rarely do they, do they score many or concede many um, does, does that make it a little bit more of a difficult situation for QPR tomorrow if there is even a sniff of Norwich City being able to to win the title in terms of what you spoke about and both the teams being at their respective levels? It happens a hell of a lot at Loftus Road, you know, and the other team winning the title. I think that's good. I can think of four or five occasions that's happened. Crew, Newcastle, West Brom have all won the title at Loftus Road towards the end of seasons. Um Get a bit sick of it after a while, Spence. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I just I hope I hope the QPR play as they have been playing, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what we look like against obviously the best team in the league if we do that. Um, like I say, we have still fallen in a hole a couple of times. Barnsley uh, took us apart. There is a cheat sheet to to playing this QPR team. There's a couple of things you can do that just takes us out of the game completely. Um, Forest. Uh, had it down to a T. Barnsley did. Uh, Huddersfield have weirdly. I think we're the only team that Huddersfield beat. Um, so if Norwich do that, it will be a long afternoon for us. Uh, if they've been watching those games and picked up, particularly on what Chris Hewton did to us, that's basically the perfect way of playing this QPR team. But what I'm hoping is for more of what we saw on Tuesday. We were fantastic at Swansea on Tuesday. Should have won by way more than the one goal that we did. And if we play like that against another of the... Um, the teams at the top, the best team in the league, then uh, I, I'm really interested to see sort of what level that puts us thinking uh, thinking about next season. Well, I think we're also, we're also unbeaten so far against the top three and the three teams that came down from the Premier League. So it'd be nice to keep that record. This is the the sixth game of six against uh, Watford, Bournemouth and Norwich. So it'd be nice to, to hold on to that record. And like I say, just keep, keep doing what we're doing and building that optimism for next season. You've also got to consider season tickets going on sale in May, you know, are people going to want to come back? Are they going to feel comfortable coming back? Have they got used to not being at the football? Have they quite enjoyed the money that's in their bank accounts not being at the football? I've certainly noticed the difference in mine not being at Euston, going to Preston away every other Saturday. You know, it, it makes a big difference. So, you know, you giving people a reason to get infused and be excited about next season and get that season to get in so that we're hopefully all back at Loftus Road in August is, it, is another incentive for us. I'm just hoping we play as we have been playing. Um, that's that's my main hope for tomorrow. I think it could be a cracking game if we do. You mentioned the the this sort of 
elements tactically that teams have been doing to beat QPR. It would be remiss of me, certainly from an Norwich perspective, to ask exactly what those are. Of course, you may not be willing to, to divulge that information. But, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> if you want to go and sit, if you uh, get all 90 minutes of Forest 3 QPR 1 is uh, is on the QPR website. If you're inclined to sit through that, then it's it's all there for you. And I'll put it in our match report on the uh, on the Sunday, uh, but I'm not going to say now. But there are, there are two things in particular that teams have done to us. And when they've done it, we've just basically fallen apart completely. So look, Daniel Farker is going to have watched that, isn't he? He's one of the best managers in the league. So, but yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say it. <laughs> very very diplomatic, I've, I've, I've promised... I promised Daniel Parker I'd call him straight after this to tell him what you said, mate. <laughs> ben, um, I'll, I'll come to you then. Off the back of, of two defeats, similar question to what I asked Clive. Do you think Norwich will head in, in, into this game with a little bit of fire in their stomach in terms of wanting to, to prove people wrong and wanting to put those, those two results right? I think that um, historically this season, when we've had a bit of a wobble, it's been followed up with them uh, making things right afterwards. So I have faith that that will be the case this time. What's been brilliant about us this season is usually when we've had a wobble, it's just been a couple of draws rather than even defeats. And even after that, you've seen a reaction. So uh, I know QPR are in good form. I think that... uh, Watford was so up for it because, you know, yeah, we'd lost to Bournemouth, but they'd lost to Luton, which was a local sort of derby, a bit of a humiliation for them. Uh, so, you know, maybe their reaction to their defeat was bigger than ours. I think that even the fact that we're talking about it, should should we be worried about Norwich losing two in a row, even though we won the title, all that sort of stuff, that's going to filter through. I hope it filters through. And um, I expect there to be a reaction. I expect them to to come out of the gates flying. Uh, You can usually tell in the first 10 minutes what Norwich you're up against. If they're in that first 10 minutes, they're right on it. They're really up for it. They're moving the ball fast, uh, getting from back to front a bit quicker. You you can usually tell almost like, like in that first 20 minutes against Bournemouth before everything went wrong. If we come out of the traps like that, uh, which I hope we will, then um, they, they shouldn't have uh, too much issue, although QPR I know are in good form. Good form. Mm. Go on then, Ben. I'll, I'll let you kick us off with, with the predictions. How do you see it going at Loftus Road tomorrow? Let's go 3-1 Norwich. This is going to be the big reaction. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. And uh, finally, is that win going to be enough to secure the title, do you think? Uh, I think it's going to need two wins out of three. Because I think it's five points. five points we need, right? Five points we need? Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, unless Watford drop points, essentially. So, yeah, we shall see. Um, Clive, I'll, I'll throw it over to you from a from a QPR perspective. How do you see the game going? And, then I'll, of course, I'll ask you for that dreaded score prediction as well. I think I've put 2-2 in our preview, although, as I've told you before, my prediction is always wrong. So, the one thing it definitely won't be is 2-2. Um, but I think that's what I've put, and I think Norwich will win the league anyway. And I've been saying that for 43 games. I don't, I just, I just think you're the best team in it. So I don't think it will matter. But yeah, I think I've gone for two-two. Lovely stuff, gents. Thank you very much. Slight, slightly chaotic, but I loved every second of it. I uh, <laughs> hope, hope you guys did as well. Um, thank you very much for watching. Of course, Pinkin.com, the place to go. Uh, we'll be at Loftus Road tomorrow for uh, all the coverage, as per usual, of Norwich City's game against QPR, where they can be crowned champions if they win and Watford drop points against Millwall. Whatever happens from here, it's going to be, it's going to be uh, probably more interesting than this show. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you again very, very soon. <laughs>